as I said, my name is James I. May. This will be fun. Um, I work at 2600 Hertz. Been there since 2010 when we started. Um, they, I would say, they taught me telecom and I taught them distributed systems stuff. Um, and we built a platform called Kazoo, which is an open source telecom platform uh, for building telecom infrastructure, uh, telco in a box, however you want to describe it. Um, we are built on Erlang. We have uh, close to a quarter of a million lines of Erlang code now. Um, we have about 106 contributors, uh, only about 25 of which have passed through the halls of 2600 hertz, the vault of 2600 hertz. Um, and we leverage some great projects that are also in Erlang, like RabbitMQ and CouchDB. And then um, on the telephony side, we leverage FreeSwitch, which is sort of the better brother of Asterisk, and Camellio, which is the better brother of OpenSIPs. There's a whole drama involved there that I won't go into now. But anyway, we stand on the shoulders of giants, and Kazoo is sort of a clustering layer on top of all of that to present a logical switch and a series of APIs for you to leverage uh, when building telephony applications. I think I had my, my points there. Um, so I'm not going to talk too much about like intro to property testing. Has anybody not done property testing or at least like read about it? OK, so hopefully this will be OK. Um, we'll see. I don't know. It's the end of the day. Um, so uh, we use JSON a lot because we do web APIs. And then uh, internally, we use JSON passing around on the AMQP bus uh, for reasons. Um, so when we first started in 2010, Mochi JSON was kind of the hotness. And a JSON object was a two-tuple with the struct atom and a prop list. And then uh, JSX and friends came along and said, well, why don't we just do a one-tuple with a prop list? And then now uh, more um, with the introduction of maps. So anyway, we had a lot of upgrade problems as uh, people had hard-coded the struct version. Uh, so we created KZJSON, which sort of abstracted what a JSON object is. Um, it provides a lot of list-like interfaces uh, with your maps and folds and filters and whatnot, as well as lots of functionality that's specific to what we do with JSON objects. Um, we wrote a ton of pro uh, unit tests, as one is wont to do when something is used heavily in a project. Um, but we weren't sure that we were properly exercising the code. Um, so we wrote some property tests. Um, the first iteration kind of was a naive, uh, let's just generate some keys and values, and the values might be uh, JSON objects themselves. Uh, but we didn't really have any control over the depth of the objects, and so we didn't know how well we were actually testing things. Um, yeah. So this, this is kind of an example of what uh, was being generated and then the, sort of the distribution of that. Uh, but there was no control over how deep this got. Sometimes you could get pathologic cases where it got super deep. Um, so then we wrote a different version that sort of takes a more iterative approach of building a key and a value and then setting it, and then sort of doing that a number of steps with a sized parameter so we can control the depth that we want. Um, and so you can see that you kind of have the steps to create the object, and then you can evaluate that to get the actual object. And most of this is hidden from you uh, when you're doing the actual property tests. Um, but then you can see that the distribution is a little more even uh, for the depth of up to eight levels of nesting. Um, and we can control that. So in production, I don't think we have more than three levels ever. So we can tune it down if we want to be faster. But this was just to show that. You can get some really nice control when you use these other uh, more advanced features. Um, yeah, like I said, it found some OK bugs, but this was actually pretty well tested uh, with our unit tests. Uh, most of the things were testing like empty binaries as keys and weird things like that that we didn't. Um, the main thing that it made us do was tighten our types for dialyzer on what we considered a JSON object, a JSON string, things like that. Um, and that, that's helped us identify issues uh, with, with our dialyzing. 
Um, so this is why Fred is here. So back in 2011, um, we have an uh, internal AMQP uh, style binding system um, where you can create um, binding keys with the dot delimiter telling you what the segments are, and then there's some wildcards that you can throw in when, to say these are the types of messages I want to receive uh, if you've never done AMQP. Uh, and so we were writing an implementation of it for internal use within the VM. And I don't even know how we got onto it, but we were just chatting in IRC or something, and I must have had some opinion held tightly, and Fred said, no, you're wrong, let me do it for you. Um, and so he helped us out and sort of introduced me to property testing, um, using this as sort of the, the introduction to it. Um, so this is uh, what it ended up coming up with, was creating, so there's the binding keys, uh, where you have the wildcards, and then you have the routing keys, which are the actual keys that you're matching on. Um, and then in this case, it uh, also generates whether it should match or should not match. Um, and so then, I won't read too much in this, but this kind of breaks down the different segments and kind of how you would interpret what it generated, and then how it matches, and then how it doesn't match. And I'm going quickly because I think everybody uh, it's not that important how this works. But anyway, we break it down. Um, and so we started running this. We introduced this in 2011. Uh, it found a bunch of low-hanging fruit uh, right off the bat. And then um, we kind of didn't have anything for about five years. And this was part of our CI pipeline, so it was getting run on every pull request, every merge to master, uh, 500 times a pop, because we didn't want to overwhelm poor uh, Circle CI. Um, and then, yeah, five years later, we got a couple pops, uh, some new test cases. And the thing that I always love about this example is these are things that no human would actually ever use for binding keys. Like, these are completely nonsensical in a practical sense, but it found these really cool edge cases in our implementation, and we're like, well, we may as well fix it. Um, and then again, we went a couple years and then had a couple months where things would pop and it was always fun when somebody's build would fail. And they'd be like, wait, the binding test failed? That never fails. And then we actually go in, and yeah. So, you know, I, I don't remember how much time we spent on it, you know, maybe a couple of days tops of part time work. But even all these years later, it's still uh, finding things as it. Uh... So, just if you don't know, it sort of generates these random inputs. So the fact that it passes doesn't mean you're bug free, it just means it hasn't found the right incantation yet. Um, but then you can see that over time it will find those fun edge cases. So these are two of the examples within Kazoo um, of stateless testing that are fun. Um, but I think the real value in property testing comes when you start working on stateful testing. Um, and this is more, if you were at Fred's talk uh, earlier, where he talked about how if you can't create a model of what you're doing, you can't really expect the operators of your system to know what to do. Uh, and I have seen this, uh, that exact story multiple times in our code base um, because we have a sort of more traditional development team, operations team, and we need to teach them uh, how to observe and interact with Kazoo. Um, so we have a simple LRU cache that we use for caching some database operations. Um, we've added some things like monitors. So if we know that a particular cache entry is tied to a particular database and document within Couch, when that document is changed, we publish an AMQP event, and the caches are all um, bound to that key, and so they can programmatically flush the entry from the cache so that the next fetch fetches the new data. Um, so we have monitors. We have some cache mitigation, uh, stampede mitigation, which is if a cache entry um, exits the cache and a ton of processes all want that same entry, that creates a lot of load on the database. So we can mitigate that by allowing you to block while the key gets populated. Um, but we need to know that the process that's doing the population doesn't die and, and all of that um, error correction that needs to happen to make sure that we actually, all of those processes that get, want the data get the data. Um, so there's all these fun little operations that we've added over time, um, and they can kind of be modeled as these sort of API commands. 
And so we can model the cache in this case. Let me make sure I'm on the same slide. Um, yeah, it just says we can model it as a simple prop list. Um, but the other thing we need to do is the LRU part is we need to time out the cache entries when they expire. And so we actually track time as milliseconds. So it, when we start the test, time is zero. And then we have uh, these timer sleep calls that we mock. Uh, and so we increment the time in our model to match the timer sleep. We assume that most of these other APIs execute within a millisecond. Uh, for, and there's, I'll talk about some of the caveats there. I don't know if this is the best way to model time, but it works pretty well for us. So for now, <laughs> this is what we're doing, and I would love to hear if people have other strategies. Um, but that's the idea. We have a very simple model of our cache. Uh, even though in our cache it's backed by ETS, we can model it with a very simple prop list. Um, and that works out pretty well. Um, yeah, so here you can see where we pick, uh, we give it just a very default state, um, the model, and then um, you can see some of the commands that it generates. Um, we give it a very constrained input for keys and values, just so, because uh, obviously if we give it like all integers, it's gonna be a long time before we get the same integer as a key. So we just give it a small range to make sure that we get conflicts more regularly uh, to make sure we're testing things. But you can see a couple examples of what proper will generate as far as these call tuples. Um, and I, I won't go too much into how it all works under the hood. Um, but this is kind of after a run, you can, it'll show you the percentages of how many times it called which API function. Um, and then you can obviously tweak those percentages to have certain calls get called more often if you're interested in that kind of stuff. Um, but it's really nice to go through and see that it is working um, and then when you find failing test cases, creating nice little unit tests from, uh, so you basically get this list of commands that failed, and then you can use that once it's finished shrinking to create a regression test to make sure you don't like, accidentally uh, regress. And so that's, that's quite nice. Um, so we don't know that it's bug free, because obviously we haven't exhausted the entire search space yet, but we're pretty confident because the unit tests pass and the property tests pass pretty regularly. Um, the caveats are that, um, so there's, proper does two passes when it's doing the testing. It does sort of a symbolic pass where it runs the API commands against the model and just kind of does that to figure out, okay, it's, at the end of it, the model should be this, right? Or at any given step, the model should be this. And then it runs it against the actual system uh, and compares what the system tells you it got with what the model predicts, right? Um, with time, because the symbolic part is going super fast um, each step, there's no delay, so time is very accurate. With, when you're doing the actual testing because the VM is under uh, soft real-time properties, there can be times where something might have expired in the model, but because the timer didn't fire in the VM, um, it fired a millisecond later, it's not expired, and so the result is wrong based on the model, but because it, so anyway, you get weird discrepancies like this on occasion. It doesn't happen very often, um, so it's good enough for us now, and usually you, when you go in to see what happened, it's pretty obvious to tell that this is just a weird uh, one-off timing bug. And again, if anybody has better strategies, I'm all ears, it's good enough. So that was pretty nice, but then the one I'm really excited on that I've been working on for the last year and a half or so um, is testing our APIs. So we have, well, if the marketing team is talking about it, we have 150 REST APIs. We have a very wide, expansive set of APIs uh, that Kazoo X offers. So you can set up your users, your voicemail boxes, your phones, um, you know, the call flows, how a call is processed in the system, and tons of other office admin-y, uh, basically anything to run a telco. Um, there's an API for it. And so we have a, a, a very big, um, space of things to test. Um, the other thing that's uh, a pernicious thorn in my side always is that when we started the project in 2010, some of the first adopters had terrible HTTP clients. 
like they could only do get and post. Um, and so we had to do things like tunnel, put, and delete uh, as verbs to know that this is what we actually wanted to do. And others couldn't touch the request headers, so they couldn't set accept or content type properly. So we have tons of hacks to figure out that, no, this actually isn't form URL encoded data, it's JSON and all this other stuff. Um, so there's all these hacks. And at the time when we were doing it, it was basically Carl and myself. And so we knew all of these hacks. And then as our team grew, they did not know all of these hacks. And so then they would write things and it would break these hacks. Um, and so there was a lot of institutional knowledge that Carl and I had that were not reflected in any kind of test framework. Um, the first four years of the project, I will admit, we were quite the cowboy coders. We were just, people wanted to see feature parity with our competitors. They, they didn't, they, they needed to see 50 features, even if they only ever used three. Um, so we did like 80% of each feature, just to claim that we had feature parity. I mean, it was, it was a process. Um, <laughs> So there's a lot of this sort of uh, technical debt that we had to, that we are addressing as we go. Um, but there was no formal, like, this is how a tunneled verb works. I mean, the long running joke was how terrible and non-existent our documentation was. Uh, we have rectified that. I think in a, done a good job of it, but, you know, I'm biased. Um, but we didn't have any way to test that the new CSV exporter hasn't broken clients that have to tunnel the accept verb to get CSV back, um, things like that. So I wanted to build this suite of tests um, using proper to test our APIs to make sure that we are properly modeling what's happening in Kazoo. Uh, for instance, with phone numbers, there's a lot of crazy state transitions between when a phone number gets added to the system, gets assigned to an account, gets released by an account, gets deleted from the system. Um, there's aging out periods and all kinds of, um, it's, it's this big state machine. Um, we don't have nice tests to make sure that numbers are transitioning through those states. Um, and it's been written and rewritten three or four times. We don't have, I don't have a lot of confidence in it, to be honest. Um, it works because we have a lot of customers that use it a lot. That's our, that's our unit testing at this point is push it live and uh, see if the users yell at us. Um, yeah, so we're, like I said, we're rectifying that um, slowly but surely. Um, so this is kind of where the model is. Um, so in Couch, everything is, an account is a database. Um, there's phone number databases and things like that. So we kind of model them as maps. Um, and then we have things like dedicated IPs. So if you sign up with an upstream carrier, uh, but somebody else on the sy same system signs up with the same carrier, they usually don't like to send calls to the same IP. So you have to have these dedicated um, SIP uh, load balance, IPs that are dedicated to that particular client for that particular upstream carrier. Um, but there's a whole process about creating the IP and then assigning it to an account and unassigning it. And you can't delete it if it's assigned and all this other stuff, which again, no tests to make sure that that's actually working other than Carl rewrote it and says it works. And it's, it's our CTO, so we assume he's right. <laughs> yeah, so I'm looking for a little more formal uh, verification that, that um, what we think in the model is what's actually happening in the system. Um, where is the slide? Oh yeah, uh, each endpoint is modeled as um, a proper statum test um, with all of the commands that it can generate. So each API, like fetching a summary uh, or creating a new one or updating it or deleting it, each of those will become a command within proper for it to run. So if it tries to edit a doc that doesn't exist, we expect to get a 404, um, and so we can write the tests um, to reflect that. I think that's the important stuff there. Um, yeah, the other thing is we have some things that trigger HTTP requests to the client. Um, so for instance, webhooks, but also uh, we have a custom storage engine. So if you want to store your voicemails on your HTTP server up on S3 or something like that, um, when you create this, what we call a storage plan, we reach out to your HTTP server 
to make sure that you can accept the request and respond appropriately um, with the protocol that we have. And so I created, we've got an HTTP server now that just sits um, on the proper side of testing uh, to make sure that the request is received, it's formed is the way we expect it, and that the, we then respond and that the API command is then successful. Um, so that's nice that we can test those sort of sorts of interactions. Um, yeah. So I apologize because at three in the morning my brain woke up and said, hey, let's go through the talk a whole bunch while you're really sleepy and I think this joke is going to kill and I don't remember any of it and so I'm a little, uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, sorry. <laughs> about that. Um, one moment, please. Open. And I didn't mirror my screen because I'm an idiot. Mm, let's all catch up on my side. Um, burp, 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 testing. Right. Um, so all of these, each endpoint module creates the list of commands that it wants to test against. Um, and then I've got a proper quick check runner that uh, collects all of those commands and creates all of the wonderful interleavings, um, as well as then calls out to each, mo each endpoint's um, next state and post condition functions. Um, I've also written a bunch of utilities because if you've ever used Dialyzer and you know how friendly those error messages are, proper can be uh, equally opaque to figure out what actually went wrong. So I've written a bunch of helpers for both running the counter examples with some really nice uh, logging, as well as just printing out a very simple version of the counter example so that you can sort of manually uh, look at it and just kind of guess at where things went wrong. Um, and then also what I'm adding now is creating counter examples um, so that you can sort of have, you can capture these failures and, and store them for later running. Um, and again, I know Rebar 3 has this kind of stuff uh, in the plugin, but because we massively predate Rebar 3, we do not take advantage of that. So a lot of NIH here. Um, yeah, so. Um, so this is an example of a counterexample that um, I've, this is the simplified version of it. Um, so you can see the interleaving. This is when I was testing the dedicated IP stuff because Carl introduced a regression and I was able to prove it uh, with this. Um, but you can kind of see the list of commands that proper will generate. And then it'll run this symbolically against the model and then it'll run it against the actual live crossbar um, API server uh, and then compare the results that it gets. Um, so some of the bugs that we've found so far, um, if you've ever seen John Hughes talk about debts, um, he's, uh, Klarna had an issue where the file would get corrupted, but it only happened every other month. They couldn't track it down, spent a lot of time on it. And then John came in and was able, I think in an afternoon or something to, with some property testing to find, um, if you open the file, closed it and then opened it again, it triggered a different code path that caused corruption. Um, we had something similar where if you created an account, immediately deleted it, and then immediately created it again, uh, there were some race conditions in the back end because we were trying to be nice and respond faster, so we spawned some things to do in the background, but it meant that you couldn't immediately recreate it. Again, who actually would do that? Well, funny you should ask, we had some clients that don't know how to write bash scripts, and they hammer the heck out of our server with create, delete, create. So that was fun. <laughs> Um, but this actually proved that, yes, there is a uh, race condition and we were able to fix it. Um, the uh, dedicated IPs that I was talking about, I was able to show Carl that he had, in fact, introduced a regression and how it worked, um, and that's fine. Um, he also, I'm really throwing Carl under the bus. Sorry, Carl, don't watch the recording. Um, <laughs> He, re he did a massive rewrite of our billing engine. It's amazing, it works really well, except there was a regression on custom rate decks. So we have sort of the global rate deck of how much it costs for, to call from a location to a location. Um, but you could also assign custom rate decks to accounts. And the way he had rewritten things didn't take into account 
that we use service plans to assign these custom rate decks to accounts. Uh, and so the testing was able to detect that and uh, give us easily reproducible steps to do that. Um, and so those have been some good ones that have been found. How are we doing on time? I'm out? OK, good. I don't have much more to say. Uh, some things in the future, we use JSON schemas to define the request data. I would like to start creating generators based on those schemas, because right now I just use the bare minimum uh, to get the request to be valid. Uh, more coverage of the APIs. And then what I think would be really cool is when somebody submits a pull request to, and it has crossbar changes to see that the test, um, the test suite, the proper test suite actually exercised the, that change set with coverage. Um, I don't know, that's just like one of the pie in the sky things that I've thought about would be cool. Um, some advice for me, I always get tripped up on next state uh, with the API result being symbolic or the concrete uh, value from the system. Um, so just make it as clear as possible that you can't rely on this being the actual result. Um, so one of the things we do is everything that we reference, uh, we reference the account name, and then we do a lookup in the shim for the API command to use the actual account ID to do the API request, uh, blah, blah, blah. Oh, writing properties from the docs. That's how I caught the regression in the dedicated IPs is because I didn't trust the code. I went to the docs, and I did what the docs said to do because that's what our users do, and that's how we found uh, the regression, and I was able to find where in the code it was wrong. Um, so that's a good way. And of course, you do have docs, right? Um, let's see. Wrapping up, uh, just some general advice. For me, um, keep it simple uh, as much as possible. Start with the very most basic uh, test that you can think of, and then expand as you gain more confidence that you're actually testing what you think you're testing. Um, property testing, at least for me, is a skill set. I have to practice it because it does not come naturally. Uh, it's very weird uh, at times, um, but it does make you think more deeply about your implementation, and that's always good, especially if you can then convert that into documentation that your team can read so they can understand what your goal is with the implementation. Uh, read Fred's book. It's really good. Um, it really breaks it down because, again, I feel like everything is prior to Fred. It was really hard to find good, approachable documentation, and now that Fred learned some Erlang and Erlang in Anger and now the property testing. There's a very nice approachable um, introduction to property testing. Um, John Hughes and Thomas Arts both have really great talks on YouTube about different types of property testing that they do. It's wonderful. Uh, and practice, 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 because you'll get better at it. Um, and yes, thank you. You can check out Kazoo on GitHub uh, or check us out slash the end. That was a great finish. Sorry. Any really quick questions? We don't have time. Just kidding. <laughs>